Hi, my name is Julia Silge, and today in this screencast, we're going to use this week's Tidy Tuesday data set on songs from the Billboard Top 100, and we're going to explore how to implement dimensionality reduction um, using Tidy Models. In Tidy Models, we use recipes, the, um, the concept we have for feature engineering or data pre-processing to approach dimensionality reduction, because often it's something that you do um, as part of feature engineering to um, get ready to train a model. And so this, um, this screencast really digs deep into recipes and how to use them, how to think about um, what a recipe is, how we think about um, how it uses training data, how you then apply it to new data. Um, uh, often when I've showed using recipes, we, we use it within the context of a workflow so we don't have to think about and some of these um, uh, uh, d details, but it can be good to know how this works, um, especially if you want to be able to um, uh, problem solve your recipe or debug your recipe or, or use it outside of workflows. So that's what we're going to do today. Let's get started. All right, let's talk about dimensionality reduction. So this, I just pasted in um, code to read this data. So um, this data from this week's Heidi Tuesday uh, has two data sets. So the first one has um, data from the billboard charts. So it has um, for every week going back a long time, you know, back here to the 60s, to all the way down to um, you know recent recent um, years, it has songs, the song, the performer, and then the song ID, which is those things squashed together. Um, when um, uh, what is the um, position of the Billboard chart? How high did it get? at its peak and how long was it on the chart totally. The other data set that we have here is like um, a a supporting data set. And so this, what this is, is, um, you know, it we we have song ID, which is, we can use to match up here, and then information that Spotify makes available through its um, <clears throat> through its API, things like what genre does Spotify put it in, and then some audio features like um, how danceable is it, how loud is it compared to other songs, how speechy is it um, versus musical, how acoustic is it, um, and then a measure of popularity here at the end. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to combine these two data sets, and then we're going to use dimensionality reduction um, in a couple of different ways to talk through um, how, how we can understand how these things are related. So let's first start with the billboard data. Um, I am going to group by that song ID and then find the, um, the max weeks on chart. So what this will do is um, max weeks like this. What this will do is it will tell us um, for all of the songs that we have on the billboard charts, what was the longest time it was ever on the chart. So sometimes songs will go on the chart and then off the chart. And some songs are on the um, the chart for a long time, like uh, this this Jay Z Beyonce song, and some songs are on for a short time. So we've got songs with staying power, and then songs that just kind of flit on and off. Now let's take that audio feature data. And let's join it up. So we unfortunately don't have audio feature for all of the songs. Um, and 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 actually, you know, there there might be some you know systematic differences in songs we do and don't have. So that's something to keep in mind. But what we're gonna do here, let's um let's let's only keep songs that we have some data for, like say that we have some of this these audio features for. And then let's um, interjoin with the the, uh, the information about 
how long, how much staying power these songs have. And let's call this Billboard Joined, like this. All right, so this is what we're gonna use. Let's do a little bit of exploratory data analysis, and then let's go ahead and talk about dimensionality reduction. So um, I, I, I actually was really serious about music for a long time. And um, so for example, I'm kind of interested in that time signature. Yes, that time signature. Um, measurement and if we can see how that works like what the distribution is how it's related to tempo so let's make a um let's make a histogram here where we can put these things next to each other like so all right, so we've got some, some of these time signatures I think mean like we don't know what it is or something like that. So let's say filter time signature greater than one, because like three means three, four, four means four, four, five means five, four. I looked this up in the documentation and let's just say time signature. And, um, yeah, let's look at that. Okay, so we can see here, you know, this is a data set of pop songs and 4-4 four, four is just, you know, way more popular than other Titan signatures. I have such a soft spot for 5-4 songs, but boy, they are not very popular, are they? The 3-4 stretches out here, but again, so much more, so much less popular there. So that's kind of, you know, like these are the kind of information that we have about the song here. We can try to use in dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction um, <clears throat> works typically because some of these variables are correlated with each other. So let's um, make a correlation plot and see what we have here. So let let me let's remind ourselves what do we have in here. Let's take the um, let's start at this first numeric audio feature and let's go all the way through to our weeks on chart which is the thing we joined in from the billboard chart. Um, I think let's get rid of it. Let's just throw away um, things that are missing data. And then let's use um, correlate from the core package here. And so now we've computed all these correlations. Uh, they, a lot of these look pretty low. If we do rearrange, it will, um, let's, there we go. Okay, so the highest one here is energy and loudness. So songs that have a high energy are louder. Um, a lot of these are very low. If we make a, um, a plot here, let's use a network plot. I don't love those default colors. So let's, um, let's put in orange, white, and um, my favorite color, midnight blue. Um, and look here. Okay, so um, you know, energy and loudness, energy and loudness are correlated. Um, energy and acousticness are anti-correlated. Acousticness and loudness are anti-correlated. We see here that this weeks on chart, which is the, um, you know, that sort of staying power on the billboard chart that we joined in is correlated somewhat <laughs> with this Spotify track popularity. So it's not, it's not, you know, measuring exactly the same thing, but it is, it is, uh, you know, it is related. Um, they're both sort of a measure of popularity in different ways. <clears throat> you know, this is not really an audio feature per se, but rather a, a different measure of popularity that we get out of Spotify. I'm going to leave this in um, <clears throat> kind of so we can see how that thing, which does track popularity, what does it do as we go through different kinds of... Um, of dimensionality reduction approaches and how does it act? Notice that a lot of these things like speechiness 
mode, key, instrumentalist over here, they are not very correlated at all with this whole kind of set of things over here. They are off by themselves. So we have a lot of items here which are not very correlated. Um, and dimensionality reduction usually tries to take uh, take advantage of correlated things to be able to make the new lower dimensions. So um, we'll have to keep that in mind as we move forward. Speaking of which, um, let's do that. Uh, there's one more thing I'd like to uh, do before we go on, and that's we this week's on chart. Let's just uh, I can make a I can make a. Um, you know, uh, visualization, but let's just look at this. Like the, the mean and the median are down here at 10, but it goes well, way high. Like there's a lot of songs that are on the chart for a short amount of time and only a few that are on a really long time. So let's, um, let's uh, take the log of that when we move on here. Okay, so let's, speaking of which, let's move on. So we are going to work through some dimensionality reduction examples. Um, Max Kuhn and I have a new chapter out in our book, Tidy Modeling with R, on dimensionality reduction. And what this screencast does is um, walk through sort of a shorter, um, more limited uh, example of how to, of the uh, some of the topics in that chapter. So I recommend that if you think, ah, that was interesting, or you want to look in more detail, let's um, take a look at uh, that chapter to learn more. So let's do some of the same stuff here to get to a good data set for our uh, our building building our new new lower dimensions new lower dimension versions here and let's so what we're going to do is we are let me load the tidy models meta package we are going to split this into testing and uh, it would help if I can split a spell initial. So we're gonna split into testing and training here. I'll do stratified um, resampling because it doesn't really ever hurt. Split. Okay, so I am um, building my data set and then piping it in to initial split. So I'm making a testing and training split here. So I have this many total, this many in training, and this many in testing. So the tidy models approach to feature engineering, data pre-processing, uh, uh, really for like causes us to have to talk about data splits because, let me type this all out, there we go. Because when we make a recipe, so a recipe is the core concept for um, feature engineering, for data pre-processing and tidy models. When we make a recipe, we start out by saying, okay, what, um, what variables am I using? What data am I using? And here, I use the training data here. And um, then, so I, I set this up. I say, here, um, here's the... Here is the, the, the variables I'm using. Here's the outcome. Everything else is a, a predictor. Here's the training data that I'm using. And let's start out by making a little starter recipe. Let's say, I, let's say um, I'm gonna make sure there's no variables that actually don't change at all. This is step zero variance. So it removes any variables that are all the same the whole way through. Um, let's and then let's normalize all the numeric predictors. Um, so what this does is it centers and scales um, uh, data. So it, find, it finds the stand, you know, the mean and the standard deviation, and divides, you know, divides and subtracts by those, so that you have centered and scaled data. And let's call this our. Um, Let's think about this as our starter recipe here. So when we have this recipe, and we've, we're just starting out with it, um, we've, de we've defined it, and, but we have not yet, um, we have not yet 
estimated those values. So if we think about this step in particular, we haven't found the mean and the standard deviation yet. The, so the next step of what we want to do is we want to um, prep that recipe. Once we prep it, you can think of that recipe as trained like this. So now, after we do this, it no longer says all numeric predictors because it has gone in and it now knows what variables are there and it has computed a mean and a standard deviation for all of these things. So the um, think of prep like um, fit for a model. So prep for a recipe is like fit for a model. You're going in and you're saying, what are the things that I need to do to um, be able to apply this data preprocessing um, uh, set of rules, set of things I want to do to new, um, to new data? And the way you apply it to new data is the verb we call bake. It applies a trained data recipe to something else. So think of bake like predict for a model. And so, for example, now I can bake the trained recipe on a new data, like, um, like our test, whoops. Uh, oh, no, I just didn't spell it right. So let me try to do that. Recipe trained, like so. So now what I'm doing here is I'm applying the means and the standard deviations from the training data to the testing data here. The reason why we want to do this is to avoid data leakage and information leakage. Because in, in machine learning, um, when we want to, if we want to train effective models, we need to keep all the um, all, all the rules about what it is that we are doing, we need to only use information from the training data uh, during our modeling process. And that includes feature engineering and data pre-processing. So we do not want to use any information from the testing data when processing the testing data. So we don't want to use any of, the in, uh, any of these values here when computing means or standard deviations or anything else, any other things. Um, so that's the why recipes works the way it does, is to avoid um, this kind of data leakage or information leakage. Okay, so we have, let's call this our base recipe. And let's now make a little, um, a little helper function. This helper function is going to be a lot like the one that is in this chapter. Let's, um, let's load the ggforce package. And then I'm going to make a uh, function that I'm going to call plot test results. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a recipe as an argument and then some data as an argument. And I'm going to use the testing data here. Um, so this, what this function is going to do is it's going to take a recipe, prep it on the training using the training data, and then apply it to the testing data. And so what this function is going to do is it's basically it's going to make a visualization. So we're going to take the recipe. Um, we are going to prep it. We're going to bake it with that dat here, which for us, we're going to we're going to use the testing data. And then I'm going to start making a visualization. So I'm going to use um, from this this GG force package is cool. It has like um, auto density and auto point. It just has some like, um, we're going to make a big scatter plot matrix, matrix um, here using auto point. So I think this is how it works. Geom auto point. And I'll put the AES in here. The, the color, I'm going to use color for weeks on chart. The example that's in this chapter is for, um, like a classification problem. And here it's more like a regression problem where weeks on chart is a numeric value. Uh, let's say, let's make these transparent. Let's make them small because there's going to be a lot of them. Is the, even though it's the testing data and it's smaller, it's still there's going to be a lot of them. Let's say geom auto density. So that's going to be for what's on the, um, on the diagonal. 
And then uh, we're going to facet matrix and we're going to facet by everything except this weeks on chart. And I think we say layer diag like that. I think because we're going to have like this two by two nice matrix. And then um, the, our color is actually not at weeks anymore. It's actually the log of weeks. So let's do that. Okay, so this is our little helper function, and what this so that what this function does, it's going to help us just like go through several examples kind of quickly, um, and uh, so the first example that we're going to do is PCA. So, what is PCA? So PCA is um, uh, me, you know, maybe the most common, uh, straightforward dimensionality reduction approach. So PCA is linear. It is um, unsupervised, and it um, uh, it tries to account for um, let's I'll say it, like account for variance. Like it tries to make new um, new dimensions that so that the they account for the most variance in that the first principal component accounts for the most variance and then the second for the second most variance and so on going down. So what we can do here now is we can take our, our base, our base recipe, we can add a new step like this, step PCA, again on all numeric predictors. And let's say, um, let's, go, let's go down, let's go to uh, number components equals four. And then let's, um, let's go into plot test results like this. And then let's add a title, PCA, like this. Uh, all right, I did something not quite right. Recipe, recipe, plot test results. Um, all right, let's see what I did. So recipe prep. Aha. Classic blunder. Classic blunder. All right. All right, that looks pretty good. I think we'll be able to see the colors a little bit better. If I change this from the default color, to a um, let's use let's use Brewer, except Brewer is for qualitative. It's distiller, right? Yes, it's distiller, and we need to make the direction go the normal way because um, it switches it inside of it, and let's um. This is one of my favorite. I think this one's really pretty. So let's do this. I think this will help us to um, see this better. Yeah, okay. So hopefully I'll make this a little even bigger so it's more on the screen. So here we can see that we do see that the, um, we see a relationship here. It's, you know, it's a, it's not dramatic, but we do see that there are more songs that have, um, that were on the chart longer, these like long lasting um, songs up in these areas, right? Of this, of these um, figures and less over this way. And the reason why, the reason why this happens, um, we can go in here and we can get, we can get out the info by tidying the, um, the, the recipe. You can tidy a recipe before or after it is, um, prepped, you can tidy the whole recipe like I did here, or I can tidy the, um, whoops, I've got to prep it like this. So I, I can tidy the recipe here now. Let's uh, make this so I can see it a little better. So we can tidy the recipe here. And now I get how much does each of these terms contribute to each of these components? So let's do a, just a little bit of munging here. We'll munge, 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 make a visualization. Um, let's just look at 
um, component in, let's paste uh, PC one, whoops, one, four, like that. So now I just have the first four components and then let's group by component and let's say slice max abs value and equals five and group. So I'm saying, let's take the top five absolute value um, terms for each component. So that's what those lines do. And then let's plot this, let's slur this onto a plot. So absolute value on the x-axis, terms on the y-axis, let's say, is it, did it go in the positive or negative direction? Um, we're making a bar chart. And then let's facet wrap little, little facets for each component. And we'll need to do free Y at least, maybe everything free. Okay, and so let's change these labels. So what is this on the X axis? It is contribution to P to, to principal component. And then that, what that fill is telling us is, is it positive or not? Because they can go in opposite directions. All right, so you can see that both in PC1 and PC2, that track popularity is in the top five. And so that's how we're getting, you know, that sort of gentle gradient there in the um, week, weeks on chart. And so PC component, remember, is unsupervised. So we are finding that when we, um, so it didn't know about the, um, it did not know about the weeks on chart. It did know about the popularity though. And so PC1 is about um, danceable, high energy, loud, popular songs um, that are not acoustic. <laughs> PC2 is about happy, popular songs that are, um, uh, oh, or maybe not happy, low energy, popular songs, low energy, um, low, low energy, dan low densible, not danceable, po popular songs, I guess. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe this is like, uh, I don't know, that's, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so that's PC1. Um, and so we see that we do see this relationship between, uh, we are able to see that weeks on chart is related to these unsupervised, um, di lower dimensions that we found. So we could, you know, use that and try to train a model with it, use these as the new predictors, but let's try something else, which is new partial least squares. So what, are, what is PLS? Um, it is very similar to PCA, except it is supervised. So instead of finding, just, just giving the math the freedom to find whatever, um, whatever, I'm actually going to copy all this, whatever kind of um, new components you want, instead we, it will find um, components that are related to the outcome. So we have to actually tell it the outcome here. In this case, weeks on chart like this. So let's um, make this. Let's see what it looks like. Let's, is it going to go? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, ah, this is interesting because we have more, less blobby shapes and kind of more like defined shapes and the gradient is stronger. I hope that comes through in the video. Um, the gradient here is stronger. The reason why is because we forced it. Like we, we forced it by using PLS instead of PCA. We're saying we're using information from the outcome now. They are, they are supervised. So let's, um, let's, copy this in here and we can see how that turned out and what contributes to these predictors. Uh, so this will now be PLS and let's call this PLS component. 
Um, I These are so pretty. I love them. But let's get rid of it so we can look here. Uh, and look that these, see that these components are different. This is now, PLS one is almost, you know, is very strongly just about popularity, less so about valence and acousticness. PLS two is about popular, um, uh, and spe popularity, speechiness, loudness, energy, and whatnot. So now popularity is uh, much more important in these components because we use the supervised approach. So we basically, we forced it. Okay, so these are both linear approaches that are very similar to each other, one supervised, one unsupervised. Um, let's end by talking about something that's really different. So it's um, UMAP. So UMAP is, um, let's do this, what is UMAP? Um, so it is not linear, um, it's very powerful, um, uh, and it basically it's, it's based on nearest neighbors plus graph networks, and then, so you start with like, the high dimensional space and you find things that are, you do like nearest neighbors there, then you build a graph network on the things that are close to each other, and then you create your new dimensions based on that network. Um, so it, we have UMAP in tidy models in a, um, an add-on package, and so what we put, put here is UMAP. Um, UMAP can actually be unsupervised or supervised. For this version, let's do um, the unsupervised version. So UMAP is, um, as this may take just a minute to pop up because it takes a little while, it's a more um, complex algorithm. But what UMAP is known for, hopefully we'll see it here, yes, are all these, um, it's known for making this kind of uh, result here that you see with these little, you know, all these little blobs, all these little shapes together. And if you look at it, like I no longer would, you know, believe that I see like really, really any relationships here with the, with the, the outcome. Um, and this happens with classification problems too, that you'll get these little clusters, but the clusters will have multiple classes in them or, um, classes will be across many clusters or, um, so you, you end up, you, to getting this kind of um, structure. You're basically guaranteed to get this kind of structure, but it's not always the case that the structure is connected to the problem that you're working on. Um, it's pretty sensitive to hyperparameters of, uh, of the algorithm. Um, so UMAP's very powerful and can be really cool, give you really cool results, but also it has some uh, significant limitations. There's been, the, <clears throat> I, you know, kind of some hot takes lately about UMAP and uh, whether it's bad or good, but um, it, it's certainly very powerful and interesting, a good thing to have in your toolkit, but also it's great to understand, you know, how it works so that you can understand uh, at least, you know, I mean, at, at some level, <laughs> so that you can understand what the, um, where it's appropriate and what some of its limitations are. All right, so today we talked about recipes. We talked about um, prep and bake. Um, the reason that recipes work this way is because um, part of the design of feature engineering and tidy models um, is um, avoiding data leakage, avoiding information leakage during training of machine learning models. And um, uh, prep, remember prep to a pre-processing recipe or a feature engineering recipe, prep is to a recipe as um, fit is to a model, bake is to a recipe as predict is to a model. So this is, you can um, think about uh, these actions in this way. Um, if you're using workflows, it takes care of all of this under the hood and does the right thing under the hood. But remember that a recipe is something you estimate from training data and then apply to testing data. Um, you can do this with something simple like you know, centering and scaling your data, or you can do this with something very powerful and complex like um, dimensionality reduction, uh, you know, for example, like with, with UMAP. So I hope this was um, helpful and I'll see you next time.